you have an envelope. And in the envelope, there are three different puzzles. Would you take out the four pieces that, go, that will make this square? And there's two puzzles that I would like you to attempt right now. All right, number one is, can you turn these four pieces from a square into a rectangle that is not a square? Can you arrange the four pieces into a rectangle that's not a square? I'm going to give you the answer to puzzle number one right now. But puzzle number two is a curiosity. There's the, there's the 5 by 13 rectangle that you're trying to make. But wait a minute. Well, it's not yellow, that's true. But I gave you a square that was 8 by 8 that has an area of 64. The rectangle has an area of 65. <laughs> so where did you get the extra, where'd you get the extra square? It's a, puzzle. it's a puzzle. It's a puzzle. Where did you get the extra square? Now, this is a puzzle that I've played with for many, many, many years. And it's only recently that I learned about some connections that are bringing me to talk about this puzzle with you. 64 equals 65? There's no use trying. One can't believe impossible things. I dare say you haven't had much practice. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Um, in a little catalog of what's at the University of Texas, Austin, in the foreword, Dietrich Turner wrote, and I just saw this about two days ago, when one works with Alice, marvelous things happen. <laughs> you should have an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper as well, and then you have this puzzle on the back. Mr. Dodgson, drew this when he was a very young man for his family that went into the family newsletter called Mishmash. And I will leave this as a challenge for you. Can you get out of the forest? Warren Weaver wrote, I wish to show how nonsense kept showing up, kept twinkling through his mathematics. Here's another maze that he drew. My goal, and I mean me, Stuart, I want to show you how how the mathematics keeps coming through the nonsense. I want to thank Martin Gardner. Yes. Because Martin Gardner, for one thing, I guess I didn't know he had, you know, was one of the founders of this, of this society. I also want to thank Martin Gardner because last year at the gathering for Gardner, after giving a six-minute version of this talk, I'm going through my slides, I'm sitting at the table, and there's a man peeking over my shoulder who hadn't been at my talk, and he says to me, why do you have all those slides of Dodgson's manuscripts? Who are you? And it was Mark Bernstein. Mark Bernstein, you know, noticed the purple ink on my, on my laptop and knew that I had something to do here, and we started talking, and next thing I know, I'm standing up here. I also need to tell you a little bit about Jerry Slocum if you don't know Jerry. Jerry is the founder of the International Puzzle Party. When I started doing research on puzzles, I wrote to him and he invited me to his backyard museum, his backyard puzzle museum, and at the end of the day, he told me that I had earned the right to apply for an invitation to attend the International <laughs> Puzzle Party. And again, that has brought different worlds together for me. And if you'll notice, he's standing by a door and there's another door to, hit, and to the right. There were two doors to get into the museum. Both of them were puzzles. You have to, you have to solve what's on the, on the door just to get into the museum. Jerry's job as a mechanical engineer 
was to design cockpits for fighter planes. Talk about a puzzle. He told me that in World War I, most of the casualties from, from, from aircraft were due to pilot error. And so designing a cockpit to minimize that was, was his career, the ultimate puzzle to try to save lives. I gotta thank Chris Morgan for this too, because at the International Puzzle Party, Chris was giving a talk two years ago about his new book, Games, Puzzles, and Related Pieces. And he showed this slide from Lewis Carroll's notes, and he showed the puzzle that you have in front of you. And he said, but it wasn't a Carroll original. He didn't invent it himself, so it's not in the book. And he went on to the other stuff that was in the book. And I'm going, wait a minute, I wanna know more about that puzzle. And so Chris directed me to, to some places for me to go look. And so thank you, Chris. One of the things I learned, in fact, it's not a Carroll original. Forgive me if I keep going back and forth between Dodson and Carroll, and sometimes I'm not sure who I'm, I'm referring to. But before those notes were drawn, this puzzle was available commercially, um, a wooden version. Not only can you arrange it to make an increase, but even the puzzle that you have in your hand, um, you can also arrange it to decrease the area to 63. We'll get back to this puzzle later, I promise. I found it in 1877. It had showed up in the Messenger of Mathematics journal. I found that in 1868, it showed up in a German journal. I found that in 1858, Sam Lloyd, who is considered the premier puzzle master of the late 1800s, he claimed that he had introduced it in 1858, but Sam Lloyd also had a reputation um, that, <laughs> that we have found no evidence that he really did it. But one thing Sam Lloyd did invent was the get off the earth puzzle. So let me show you just what this means, the get off the earth puzzle. So I'm going to move to, let's make sure, let's move to the document camera so you can see this puzzle. I, Okay, and there are 13 men around the, around the globe, and if you rotate it, let's see, right now there are, right now I've got to point it in the right direction. Right now there are 13. If I rotate it this way, now there are 12. Get off the earth, where did he go? Well, this is what makes this puzzle so interesting, and I should say that there were millions of these produced. They got used for all sorts of advertising purposes. In particular, one of the more interesting sources of advertising was that was it got used by William McKinley in the 1896 election, where they put the Republican platform on the back and put this on the front. Now, what does this imply? <laughs> Okay, this was at a time when the Working Man's Party in, in California, their official slogan was, the Chinese must go. So the Republican Party wasn't coming out explicitly and saying it, but by handing this out, oh my goodness. Seventeen seventy four. I find in a book called Rational Recreations, in which the principles of numbers and natural philosophy are closely and copiously elucidated by a series of easy, entertaining, interesting experiments. <laughs> I love the title. I find that <laughs> the first edition, in, which came out in 1774, shows a three by 10, I'm really looking on the left, it shows a three by 10 that when you cut it up into four pieces, you get two rectangles that show a gain of eight units of area. Well, this was a mistake. Actually, if you cut it up, what you really get is what shows up in the fourth edition where you get a four by five and a two by six. You gain two units of area, not eight. Now, what makes this very interesting is that Hooper, 1774 to 1794, but at the same time, Guillaume writes a French recreational math book that had the same two mistakes. And Guillaume's came out ahead of Hooper. 
I think we're seeing some plagiarism happening. And Hooper wasn't very, it took Hooper four editions to get it fixed. It took Gio only two editions to get it fixed. 1545, Serlio says, a man has a table. It's three, it's, it's three feet by 10 feet, but he wants a table that's four feet by seven feet. So let's cut the table on the diagonal into two triangles, just like this. So we have an area of 30. Let's slide that as so. So there's our four by seven table. And the two triangles add up to an area of three. Well, what we don't know about this one, obviously 30 does not equal 31, but what we don't know is did, did Serlio do this intentionally or not? This wasn't in a recreational mathematics book, okay? We don't know. But yet this is the first, this is the first, this is the earliest reference to this kind of a geometric vanish puzzle. Where things, where the area seemingly disappears or or appears. Lloyd patented this idea, 1896. Didn't do him much good <laughs> because we have so many puzzles like this. And in fact, in 1889, Fred Howard patented a version of the puzzle as well. I didn't put this one in your packet because it would have taken too many, too much to cut up this many for everybody was done, <laughs> okay? But this is one of the puzzles that's on the back tables, and you're welcome to help yourself to what's on the back table. And there's scissors if you want to try cutting these up before, you, before the end of the day, if you choose. In this case, you have a three by eight, and when you cut it up, you can make two things. You can cut it up and arrange it into a, a five by five square, with or without a hole. Now, without the hole, I mean, that's two puzzles. Without the hole, 24 equals 24. Oh, excuse me, with the hole, 24 equals 24. But then when you arrange it without the hole, where did it come from? Where did it come from? Political uh, messages have not gone away. Here's the get off the earth puzzle in the mid 1950s in Esquire magazine. And I know this is, I tried to enlarge it as much as I could, but you probably can't read it. It says, swivel the arrow to northeast. Count the red Chinese. Now swivel to northwest and count again. What happened to the 13th man? Why can't the American government solve its recognition problems this neatly? I'll, I will leave that be. 2006. I'll read to you. And then this is, they, they are quoting Hillary Clinton here. One international war criminal always has to look over his shoulder. If you think he can't be found, oh, someone been lying. <laughs> that Joker George has conveniently forgotten him, but it doesn't take a crystal ball to see the future. So you have George Bush juggling, you have Hillary Clinton with a crystal ball, and you have Osama bin Laden. And when you rotate it, Hillary is holding Osama. Uh, bin Laden's head in her hands, and George Bush is now juggling for the dog, and there's one person gone. We've gone from eight people down to seven. Same kind of puzzle. Martin Gardner, I think my first introduction to this puzzle was many, many, many years ago um, in the Gotcha book and the Vanishing Leprechauns, where 15 leprechauns can be rearranged into 14 leprechauns. And I thought about giving you that one. It's on the back table. But then I saw when on this one, I figured, let's, let's go with the Cheshire Cat. Why don't you take it out of the envelope? What color is the Cheshire Cat? Purple. Purple. How appropriate. So the question is, which one is the Cheshire Cat? So put the three pieces together. This, I think this makes more sense if you can see it right in front of you instead of up on the screen, but I'll do it with you up here on the screen. All you have to do is take the two pieces that are on the top and reverse them. Just reverse them. Now, there's a bit of a clue as to what's going on here when you look at this. Because with the leprechaun puzzle, 
the hints that are given. It says, which one vanishes? Where does he go? And when he comes back, where has he been? <laughs> so let me ask you that question. Which one vanished? It seems pretty obvious we would say the one in the middle vanished. But then I'm going to ask the question, where did he go? <laughs> so I put a third puzzle in your envelope. Oh, but I better warn you. <laughs> this was, Dudney was, a, Dudney was a contemporary. I wonder if, if Dodson knew Dudney. Do you know, Chris, did, did they know each other? It certainly, it certainly would make sense that they would know, you know, they were certainly contemporaries. Now, according to Martin Gardner, somebody went to jail for doing this, so please don't do this with real money anymore. In fact, the government has, has chosen to counter the counterfeiters. Um, you have $900 bills. They're already cut. Have you found them? I think they're, the, I think, what color are those? Those are green, of course. <laughs> and so if you cut your money and rearrange them like this, well, here, let me do this. You notice that I've got fractions next to each one of them. They all add up to one. When we slide it down, now we have $10 bills. Have you ever, have you ever had to tape a $100 or a piece of currency back together? Yes. It happens. Have you ever had a piece of currency that was, had a piece torn off and was missing? That happens. What does it take to be legal? What does it take to be legal? And it's not more than 50%. You don't have to have more than percent, more than 50%. I have used a subtitle on this talk in the past. It's called, Why U.S. Currency Has the Serial Number Printed Twice on Each Piece of Currency. All right, the serial number's up there twice on each one of them. Check your bills. When you do this rearrangement, yes, you gain an extra bill. But those in the middle, let's see, you don't have to have 50%, but you have to have both serial numbers, and they better match. Okay? So, can we explain the Cheshire Cat and the Leprechauns? What do these fractions add up to now? So in other words, which $100 bill disappeared? That's a misleading question, isn't it? They all, well, they're all different, aren't they? They're all different. It's all been rearranged and it's all hidden very cleverly. Here it's pretty clear that they're all a little bit shorter than they used to be. In fact, they're all one-tenth shorter than they used to be. What I love about this I teach mathematics up at Humboldt State University. I work with future elementary teachers. What I love about this is I can use elementary mathematics to explain this puzzle. And to me, that's, you know, that's why I pursue this. That's, where, that's why, I can make an ex why I can make this. <laughs> this is part of my research. This is why I do this, is because I'm bringing this stuff to the classroom. How can I make mathematics interesting for my students? And I'm going to get back to Dodson on that one. When Jerry invited me to his house, now he's got 80,000 puzzles in this museum, he said, bring me a new one I haven't seen before. I'm going, great. How am I going to do that? Well, in the middle of the night, the Reverend Dodson was also an insomniac. I gave this, but, but this email that you see on the left was sent to me at 5 o'clock in the morning, right after I had done this talk at Western Michigan University. And the man who sent it to me said, I've been thinking about this. I've been laying awake at night. And you see these six men here? No. <laughs> Which one disappeared? They all did, didn't they? And I think that this one really demonstrates, what I love about this is it demonstrates the paradox and helps to see through what's going on. So, Chris pointed me towards the Parrish Collection at Princeton University, and I had the, the wonderful opportunity to spend a day there. 
I need to go back. I have to spend more time. I feel like I'm just beginning you know, what I'm doing. And you know, begin, you know, what you're seeing here is only the beginning of this. I found thousands of pages of mathematical manuscripts in boxes, some of it very unorganized, actually. Some of them just scribbles of computations, all in purple ink, all in purple ink. Some of it was absolutely gorgeous. Here's a proof that the, of trisecting an angle, or should I say, the, you know, his explanation, and this is not done, what, what he did here was not strictly compass and straight edge, for those of you that, that know more about this, but he did this when he was 12 years old. When I went to Parrish, the Parrish collection at Princeton, Stan Isaacs, who I know many of you know, and thank you, Stan, for pointing me and getting me to look for this. Stan was looking for a particular billiard ball problem. So every time I found one, I took a, took a photo of it for Stan. It says, find the path of a billiard ball in a cube, which goes on the same path forever and strikes all six sides, gravity neglected, At the top of the page it says, I thought this partly out and wrote out the result on another occasion. Sometimes he would write at the top of the page, not thought out. <laughs> Here the, the goal is to, to have a billiard ball travel around a non-rectangular table. Here's a third one where he says a billiard ball, a, a billiard table is nine feet four inches long and it is, uh, let's see, it is, can I read it better? It is nine feet, four inches long. It is 10 feet wide. And the goal is to, it starts in the center and you have to, let's see, the goal is to, to hit all, it has to hit 16 cushions it, and then hit into a corner pocket. And it has to travel a total of 75 feet, 10 inches. What you see on the right is Dodson's solution to this. Um, some beautiful mathematics here using, using reflection symmetry, the understanding that, that all, every one of these tables is just a mirror reflection, and, but he's laid it all out in one straight line. I'd be happy to make these slides available if you're interested and want to get a closer look at these. I found a fourth pool table, billiard ball problem in the pillow problem, in the pillow tales book, uh, a triangular billiard table. A point is given. A, you know, a point is given by trilinear coordinates. A ball strikes all three sides and returns to the starting point. Find the, um, find the point where the ball strikes the second side. Again, many, many problems like this. I found these notes. I love this one. Okay, it says on the bottom, can there be traced in one line each, or if not, in how many? going by the route of always crossing to a new oval and every point of contact. Basically what he's asking, can you draw this without picking up your pencil? That's your goal. Let me read a letter. Or no, this is not a letter. But this is what you see on the right. And again, the goal on the left is to draw it without picking up your pencil. 40 years after, let's see, after he died, let's see, one, when his nephew, Stuart Collingwood, was writing his biography, he got a lot of feedbacks from many of Dodson's young friends. She writes, we met for the first time in the Forberry Gardens. He was, I believe, waiting for a train. I was playing with my brothers and sisters in the gardens. I remember his taking me on his knee and showing me puzzles. The puzzle, this puzzle was, by the way, a great favorite of his. The problem is to draw three interlaced squares without going over the same lines twice or taking the pen off the paper, which is so thoroughly characteristic of him in its quaint manner. So two very, the two puzzles are, are very much the same. And it made me think about this problem, which in the 1700s, the people of Konigsberg, Prussia, they have, they have two islands and seven bridges that connect the two islands with the mainland. And one of the things that they liked to do would be go, to, go for a walk. And what they wanted to do was cross all seven bridges without crossing any of them twice. This was the beginning of graph theory. And this was the beginning, and it was Leonard Euler who was able to prove that it is actually impossible 
to cross all seven bridges once without having to retrace your steps. And then I learned that when, when Dodson traveled through Europe, he went to Konigsberg. Makes me wonder if he had any interest in this puzzle because he gave children very much a similar puzzle. And he went to Konigsberg. I have not found any evidence. He never wrote about, about this particular puzzle and I haven't found anything out there. Please let me know if you know anything about this. One of the, you know, and, and he even took it to three dimensions because here I found in these notes where he's trying to wrap a string, one string, all the way around a cube. Very much a similar kind of a puzzle here. Can you take one piece and go all the way around the cube, wrapping it as so? And then tucked in between the manuscripts, I found this little, two little cards, two letters that, Mark said, you have to share these, Stuart. He said, you can't not share these. Let me read to you. Dear Mrs. Gerens, I'm reading the one on the right. Dear Mrs. Gerens, and he wrote this less than a year, about just about a year before he died. I would have much liked to come to you last night and was quite sorry to be debarred by the form of your letter, which was practically an invitation, underscore. At present, I can tell all friends and truthfully that I never accept invitations and I can't surrender my present secure solitude even for the pleasure of an evening with you. Please only send me information in the future and if you add I shall have joy to see you, please spell it with a big J. Sincerely yours, C.L. Dodgson. There's been a lot of question, you know, about his relationships with adult women. Um, there has been this letter, I know I'm not the first one to find this because I know that Edward Wakeling included it uh, in the diaries. So there, there is some information about it, but uh, very curious. And the fact that what we do know is that as he got towards the end of his life, he was shunning any adult soci you know, socializing with other adults because he wanted to do more mathematics. That was what he wanted to do. And he didn't want to give up an evening. Although children were another story. Where does the day begin? This was an interesting puzzle of his. And I'm going to just, I'm going to read to you. It says, if a man could travel around the world so fast that the sun would be always directly above his head, and if he were to start traveling at midday on Tuesday, then in 24 hours, he would return to his original point of departure and would find that the day was now called Wednesday. At what point in his journey would the day change its name? Well, when he wrote this, when he first put it out, there was no international dateline. <laughs> and by the time he, um, before he died, I think it was 1880-something when the international dateline was established. So this was a real issue. And I don't know if he had much influence in the creation of the international dateline, but certainly I'm sure that this question was out there. Um, it had to have caused some of the interest and the, conf you know, the confusion here. Imagine that, you know, that this is certainly something and, and, and that he thought about it and it puzzled him and it bothered him as well. Charles Dodson would refuse mail that was addressed to Lewis Carroll. He would deny that he was Lewis Carroll. And you don't see much overlap, but here is a page of his notes he writes, 1 17th in decimals is 0 0.0588235294117627, and it goes on and on and on. And then he goes on to write a whole lot about this particular circulating decimal. But look what it says up at the top of the page. Look wild. No hams. Oh, my. Where did that come from? <laughs> Where did that come from? And I'm very curious about this one because, as I said, Carol and Dodson were almost two different people. But on this page, it seems like there's something bringing them together here. And what is it about this particular page, you know, about this particular one that made him do this? He collected all kinds of mechanical devices. 
As a boy, he would make puppets. He collected music boxes, uh, certainly mechanical puzzles. He always had a puzzle in his pocket, okay, that, you know, that there's the handkerchief mouse that he always had. Um, he always had a wire puzzle, by the way. This little guy is needed to get some air here. He needs to get some air. And he would take a handkerchief and fold it up into a little pocket mouse, okay? And Isa Bowman, oh, let's see. <laughs> You know, he had this. Let's see, one of the young girls writes, Next, I went out looking for my twin daughters. I find them seated with CLD, seated between them, and they're listening to him open mouth in the greatest state of enjoyment with his knee covered with minute toys. Always toys. In his diary, he writes, I met my blue china friend and had some talk with her and tried her with my usual card of introduction, the wire puzzle. On another day, he writes, on the railway going back, I made friends with a nice girl of about 15 who was on her way to school in Eastbourne. I gave her my card and promised her a wire puzzle. Here's a letter. He writes, my dear Alice. And there were some references that this might be Princess Alice, uh, the queen's daughter. Please excuse me if this is written very badly, but how can one attend to one's writing, you know, when a great hairy green thing is crawling all over the letter? And he did draw a picture of a spider on this letter. I shouldn't mind it so much if the thing would just keep still. What I didn't like most is that it will crawl about all the time. Isn't it provoking of it? Please give this note to your mother and this puzzle to Charlie. The two wire men are England and Ireland, and the puzzle is to make them join and unjoin their hands. They give a sort of rule for doing it, but even with the rule, it's rather hard. Tell him it goes quite easily if you do it right away, so he mustn't push hard to get the wire loops over each other. And if he does, it'll get into such a mess, you'll never get it right again. Give Charlie my love and take two or three crumbs of it for yourself, yours affectionately. Now, we don't know that this what that puzzle looked like. One of the things is he gave away a lot of wire puzzles, but we don't have those puzzles. Chris Morgan did some research, and this was in James Delgetti's collection. And it certainly seems to fit the description. It certainly seems to fit the description that this might be it. He writes, he writes, this afternoon, I shared a bench on the Marine Parade with a gentleman and his wife and a nice little girl about 10, to whom I showed some puzzles. A pleasant child, though not very bright. <laughs> On a Sunday afternoon, he writes, I met Mrs. Blakemore and Dolly at about one on the parade, and Dolly not only spoke to me without crying, but actually asked me to come in with them. Stayed about an hour, showing her puzzles, etc., and it really looks as if they were good friends at last, after five weeks' estrangement. Went over to Brighton and talked to the girls' school. Twenty girls for whom I did puzzles for more than an hour and a half. Isa Bowman wrote about how he would keep things in his apartment. And so, so, oh my goodness, whoop. <laughs> Bob the Bat. Bob the Bat, well, this is actually, this is the closest I could find to Bob the Bat. And he would fly about, the children loved it. He kept it in his left hand drawer. What would he do when uncle wound him up? He would really fly. Those of you that are engineers, you know, here's a man who's an insomniac. He's always thinking about things. And anyone who has tried, as I often have done, the process of getting out of bed at 2 a.m. in a winter night, lighting a candle and recording some happy thought, which would probably be otherwise forgotten, will agree with me it entails much discomfort. Now all I have to do is to draw from under the pillow a small memorandum book containing my nictograph. Write a few lines or a few pages, and without even taking it outside the bedclothes, replace the book and go to sleep again. And here's his nictograph that he invented, and this is the code. This is what it would what it would look like when he would write. So he was designing, you know, so clever, so clever for those long nights. And I'm also, now I'm here, I'm going to start watching the clock and go through a few of these. And I need to say a little bit. James Newman wrote 
that he was a mediocre mathematician without brightening the hour of a single student or producing anything of lasting value to his subject. Warren Reaver wrote, in all of Dodgson's mathematical writing, it's evident he was not an important mathematician. Jenny Wolfe wrote, he was too focused on rules and procedures. He was unattractive to his students. A student wrote, he was singularly dry and his perfunctory manner in, in which he imparted instruction to us, never betraying the slightest personal interest in matters that were of deep concern to us. As I explore his diaries, as I read from other people, I'm finding that this wasn't true. Or maybe what I'm finding is that he was misplaced. He should have been an elementary school teacher and not a university lecturer. Because when he st after he retired, he started to go to schools to work with children. And they loved him. They absolutely loved him. They would look forward to him coming. Little girls, let's see, you know, his fancy was sometimes suffered to peep out. Little girls who would learn the rudiments of calculation at his knee. They found the path that they had imagined so thorny set about with rosins by reason of the delightful fun which, which he would turn task, a task into a joy. When the fun was over, the little girl would find she had learned the lesson just the same. When I went up to Oxford, I learned from Mr. Dodgson to look upon my mathematics as the most delightful of all my studies. His lectures were never dry. So we can find both arguments, even at Oxford. Do you ever play at games? Or is your idea of life breakfast lessons, dinner lessons, tea lessons, bed lessons, breakfast lessons? It is a very neat plan of life, and almost as interesting as being a sewing machine or a coffee grinder. <laughs> But it seems like that's the way he taught, at least at Oxford. At least that's what most of what we see. But then here he is teaching games again, where one player names three or four letters in a word, and the other has to guess the word. Many, many word games like that. And he, one time he went to a, he writes in his diary that he gave his first logic lecture at St. Hugh's Hall to 13 girls, including Evelyn Hatch. And Evelyn wrote 40 years later, that my old friend Mr. Dodson offered to come and give us a lecture on logic. With great eagerness, my fellow students prepared to meet the famous mathematical tutor who was the author of Alice in Wonderland and assembled in the library armed with notebooks and pencils. To their surprise, the lecturer appeared with a large black handbag from which he proceeded to draw a number of white envelopes to be distributed among the audience. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Each envelope proved to contain a card marked with two square diagrams and nine counters, some pink and some gray. Notebooks and pencils were not required. We were to play a game. He turned logic into a game. Stephanie, you made a reference a couple hours ago about a Venn diagram happening up here. And I'm just beginning to discover that as his... If he had lived longer, he developed a, something an, similar to Venn diagrams, which we will call Carroll diagrams. And what I have been reading and learning, and I need to go learn more, is that if he had lived longer, it's possible that he would be remembered as a logician and one who did contribute to the field of logic, because he did do quite a lot with it. And it is said that these Carroll diagrams actually work much better with larger sets. And again, I'm not going to get into the details. I'm not even comfortable with it myself. I'm just getting into it. But, you know, but yes, we had a Venn diagram up here, but we also had a Carroll diagram up here as well. In the preface to Symbolic Logic, he writes, it's used mostly in enabling one to assert one mental, one's mental powers. It gives the clearness to see your way through a puzzle the habit of arranging your ideas in an orderly and get addable form, and the power to detect, detect fallacies in other people's arguments. In the preface to Curiosa Mathematica, he wrote, it may well be doubted whether in all the range of science there is any field so fascinating to the explorer, so rich in hidden treasures, so fruitful in delightful surprises as that of pure mathematics. The charm lies chiefly, I think, in the absolute certainty of its results, for that is what, beyond almost all mental treasures, the human intellect craves. Let us only be sure of something. 
And I think that, you know, it shows not just a love for the topic, but again, I find that he has a way with words that I can't seem to get across to my students, this love of mathematics just for its own sake. But he puts it in words here that makes me think, you know, he, he's, he could do it. He could do it. And, but he was in the wrong place and perhaps at the wrong time. He loved nothing more than to invite children over to his apartment for tea and logic. An excerpt, an excerpt from his diary. He loved number tricks. And again, many, many, many number tricks about who can get to a hundred first. He loved numbers. My dear Gertrude, I send you seven kisses to last a week. Your loving friend. My dear Gertrude, Gertrude, I send you 10 million kisses and remain your loving friend. C.L. Dodson. My dear Gertrude, Gertrude. I send you four and three quarter kisses. My dear Gertrude, this will not do, you know, sending one more kiss every time by post. The parcel gets so heavy, it is quite expensive. When the postman brought in the last letter, he looked quite grave. Mind you, don't get any more such letters, he said, at least not from that particular little girl. I promised him we would send each other very few more letters, only 2,470 or so. Oh, he said, a little number like that doesn't signify. What I meant is you mustn't send many. So you see, Gertrude, we must keep count now. And when we get to 2,470, we must not write anymore. Your loving friend. In this little letter here, he talks about morning dress affairs as opposed to evening dress affairs. His dinner parties are morning dress affairs. And he also writes at the bottom, I will come for you at six and a quarter. Fractions used to tell time, an interesting way to do it. Or if, if, each, if in picking a quarrel, if each party declined to go more than three-eighths of the way, and if in making friends each was ready to go five-eighths of the way, why, we would have more reconciliations of quarrels. I love it. Elementary mathematics <laughs> to, to reconcile? The consumption of Majera has been during the past year zero. After careful calculation, I estimate that if this rate of consumption be steadily maintained, our present stock will last us an infinite number of years. And although there may be something monotonous and dreary in the prospect of such vast cycles, we may yet cheer ourselves with the thought of how economically it can be done. <laughs> Dividing by zero, what a great way to, to, to demonstrate it. I think I will go through. I'm going to watch because I certainly want to share this one. My darling Isa, it's all very well for you and Nellie and MC to unite in millions of hugs and kisses, but consider the time it would occupy your poor old very busy uncle. Try hugging and kissing MC for a minute by the watch, and I don't think you'll manage it more than 20 times a minute. Millions must be two million at least. And then he goes, 20, two million divided by 20, hug, two million hugs and kisses divided by 20, that's 100,000 minutes. Divided by 60, that's 1,666 hours. Divided by 12 hours in a day, that's 138 days. Divided by six days a week, that's 23 weeks. I wouldn't go on, and then he writes, I wouldn't go on hugging and kissing more than 12 hours a day, and I wouldn't like to spend Sundays that way. So you see, it would take 23 weeks of hard work. Really, I can't spare the time. <laughs> I struggle to get my students to comprehend what a number like two million means. Here Dotson is doing it back when supposedly the elementary curriculum was very dull. And he's finding ways to bring it alive. He's finding ways to make them interested and make it connected. He came up with rules for addition and subtraction and rules for, for division. He, came, he explored cyclic numbers, which all I want to say about cyc repeating decimals that go on and on and on in a repeating pattern, and all I'm going to say about it is that in his eight or nine wise words about letter writing, he wrote, don't repeat yourself. 
When once you have said your say fully and clearly on a certain point and have failed to convince your friend, drop the subject to repeat your arguments all over again will simply lead to his doing the same and so you will go on like a circulating decimal. Did you ever know a circulating decimal to come to an end? Again, he brings math into some really unrelated places. Here's a notebook with his, with his lecture notes for algebraic geometry. Here's the pages I was looking for. Obviously, I found a lot more. I'm going to spare you the details that are on this page, but I will say this. If you rearrange those four pieces, you're going to notice a long, skinny gap. Guess what the area of that gap is right in the center? And what he did is he got into exploring where we gain. He came up with some methods. By the way, I've gotten my, my, my cue here that I need to wrap things up. So he f came up with some generalizations about this puzzle that I wasn't aware of. Notice in this diagram, he's emphasizing, he's exaggerating this gap. And what's interesting here is he's explaining it in a way that I hadn't explained it before. I hadn't, I hadn't used his explanation. He's also using notation that I hadn't seen before as well. He, he, he found the area of that gap using a formula that I wasn't aware of either. You know about doublets, so I'm going to go on with, I'm going to, going to keep going with that. And I guess what I will do here to finish this up, he knew about the 15 puzzle. In fact, he spent an evening with the 15 puzzle, which was sort of the, the this puzzle took America by storm. And the only thing that's come close to that has been the Rubik's Cube. This puzzle is on the back. Notice when you rearrange it, one rabbit just, you know, but it's easy to explain this one because where do rabbits go? <laughs> Down the rabbit hole. And if you ever burn a hole in a rug, come read this because cut, if the, you know, you can cut it up in a certain way so that you can rearrange the pieces and it will still be the same size and the hole is gone. And for those of you that like to write, Here's an eight-line poem. I won't read it to you. But you can turn it into a seven-line poem if you like. <laughs> and it's on the back table, by the way. It is on the back table. He wrote, it occurred to me that if we take letters and put them on a chessboard and move them around, they might form words. Is this the beginning of where Scrabble came from? Do I have time to finish with this? Very quickly, very quickly I will finish with the Martin Gardner dollar. Because you see, in from the country of money, that if we move Martin out of the way, whoops, you can't see it, let me escape and go here and full screen. So here is, here's a Martin Gardner dollar bill. It's a very special dollar bill because if we cut it up as so, and we remove Martin, and then we take the pieces and turn them upside down and put them back together, Where'd Martin go? Well, let's see. We turn Martin over. Thank you very much.